my name is Chad Washington. I'm uh, head of product development for uh, Butler Studios. So how I'd like to run this is a bit of an intro, uh, and then some foundations for what I think you need to have uh, for some of the other things that I'll talk about in terms of maintaining test suites in the longer term, uh, and then uh, I'll talk about how to structure your test. I uh, won't get into too much code. There's a little pseudo code. We're really talking about uh, what do you need to do with your test to make them maintainable, and then some activities day to day uh, that you need to do uh, to keep them uh, maintainable in the long term. So first, a little bit about me. I am, uh, um, as my said again, head of product development. Um, but I used to manage our uh, product twist. And I've had a long uh, career doing various roles in software development. And that's important because uh, in terms of automation, it's how I came to automation. I uh, did various roles on projects, suffered uh, due to a lack of automation, and in many cases, or automation done incorrectly. So I really took this up as a passion as something that I really wanted to fix and subsequently uh, became involved with uh, TWIST. Uh, to address some of these problems. So the first thing to, to sort of check the box on is what's the difference between functional testing and acceptance testing? You hear uh, this often in the title of this webinar is maintaining automated acceptance tests. Well, what is an acceptance test? An acceptance test is any uh, uh, test that verifies that an implemented piece of functionality, a story, or, or a requirement uh, meets the acceptance criteria that was defined for it. And acceptance criteria in the Agile world tend to be the things that say, this makes a story done. Those things can be non-functional or functional. Uh, and they can cover a wide gamut of things like the performance of this page needs to be this, or a user needs to be able to accomplish uh, this other thing. Um, however, the majority of the time when people talk about acceptance testing, they are talking about the functional bits. And so the, the core of this presentation uh, is going to focus on the functional bits. Obviously, you do want to automate other parts of the acceptance uh, testing uh, chain, like performance testing or load testing. But we're going to focus uh, this talk on the functional aspects of, of acceptance testing. So uh, this webinar is part of our continuous delivery series, and the book Continuous Delivery, uh, written by Jeff Humble and David Farley, focuses a chapter on uh, automated acceptance testing. And automated acceptance testing is really important for continuous delivery uh, for several reasons. One, um, to, to be able to have a real deployment uh, pipeline that uh, is reliable and repeatable, you need fast feedback at all stages of the pipeline about the state of your software. So you need to be able to know, okay, I made this change to my software. Is it working? And automation allows you to run tests quickly uh, so that you can get that feedback. Um, the other part of the deployment pipeline is that you are starting from what may be a developer build, something simple, and moving your, your code to, uh, to production in a path where your environments get more and more production-like. So you may have a UAT environment, performance testing environment. You may have a security testing environment. You may have multiple QA environments. These environments, as you move them, uh, as you get closer and closer to production, should be more and more production-like. And you want to be able to get feedback from those environments having automated tests that are portable that you can put run here, run there, run in different uh, configurations really help you uh, manage that. And if you're running your software on different platforms, the ability to check, does this work uh, on Firefox, does this work uh, on Internet Explorer, does this work on Windows versus Linux, that portability is really important because it saves a lot of testing effort. We also see uh, in a lot of organizations that the testing cycle really comes at the end of the software development process. So people do agile development up front, and then there's this handoff to a separate QA group, and that QA group has some defined amount of time in the project plan to, to do a bunch of testing. And that takes, uh, that takes time at the end, and it um, 
reduces the ability of teams to respond to whatever's found in that last stage because it's at the end and it's a fixed amount of time. So really being able to reduce that cycle time and say, hey, you know what? We need to know right now uh, and we're not at the end of this release cycle what the bugs are so that we can fix them. And lastly, a better time allocation. Uh, if you build an automated, uh, particularly a regression suite that is uh, comprehensive, then you can spend less of your time doing the, the manual uh, regression activities that are beneficial. But ultimately, the marginal benefit of doing it manually decreases over time. Uh, so that whatever a, a machine can do, a machine can it should do, and whatever people are good at, people should do. So the, the headline really is that CD uh, isn't possible without strong automated acceptance testing. But uh, automated tests are difficult to maintain. And I think there's three classes of problems. Uh, there are more problems than this. These are the, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the big problems that people tend to see. Uh, and the first is what I call reference or locator brittleness, meaning that if I'm testing at the GUI level, there are these things, objects, buttons, et cetera, that uh, have um, the possibility of moving around, changing their name, changing other associated metadata about them, and then they're hard to work with. Or the way I do something, uh, I may log into an application, the way I do that may change, and that creates brittleness. Uh, functional testing is fundamentally an imperative problem uh, They're in an object-oriented world. So back in the 80s and 70s when people did mostly comparative programming, kind of style actually suits functional tests very well because I'm doing step one, step two, step three, step four. But our tooling today and how we develop software is more object-oriented. And so how do we bridge that gap? How do we do something that is fundamentally imperative that's not like building a system that has a domain? Uh, and how do we use object-oriented tools to do that? And then the last uh, um, area that tests tend to be difficult to maintain is what Martin Fowler refers to as non-determinism, or what you'll commonly hear as flaky test. And so um, <clears throat> often people have a test that is functionally executing correctly, but is failing for a myriad of, of other reasons. And actually trying to maintain the test, uh, given all those failures that are, um, that are not deterministic, is difficult. So this talk is going to focus on doing strategies uh, to help you uh, avoid these problems. So some foundations. Uh, the first thing is you want to get your manual testing a house in order. Uh, and what that means is that your manual tests are not expressive. They're not declarative. And we'll talk about declarative a little bit in a little bit. Uh, they're not modular. They're not clean. Then you don't want to start uh, from your, uh, your manual test. Uh, as a, as a foundation. My first job out of college as a uh, product manager uh, for .com, and the whole organization uh, used to test the app uh, at the rollout, and we used to get these test plans that were so obtuse uh, because they said, click this button, do this thing, do this thing. And we never quite understood what we were supposed to test, and even I was a product manager, so I knew the app well, but I didn't understand what the point of the test was. I was just executing it because that's what the piece of paper said to do. And you need tests that are comprehensible by humans. Uh, like, what's the point of this test? What am I trying to accomplish as a starting point before you start to automate anything? Uh, and if you don't have that, uh, you should start over uh, and not try to automate uh, what's broken. The next is choosing your technology to automate in. Um, and uh, I actually have written this slide. You see the, the points here. They're actually in priority order. And this is one of the things that I see a lot with teams uh, choosing test automation tools. They don't choose these things in the right order. So for example, uh, people like to choose a, a tool that fits with kind of their style, which is a good thing. All these things here are important but it fundamentally the underlying technology that you have doesn't um, 
uh, the, the dri underlying driver technology that you have doesn't work well with your system under test, then it's a moot point. You should choose a driver first that works with uh, what you're trying to test well uh, and, and then deal with, uh, you know, the, the sort of consequences of that as you go. Um, above a driver, you need to choose a clear um, framework, and we'll talk about frameworks uh, for reuse. Uh, in my experience, raw driver strategies scale for about a year or two. So that means I go download uh, Selenium or something like that, and I try to use it, uh, or even a commercial-grade tool, and I haven't put a framework on top of it, and I'm writing raw scripts, that I can do that for a year or two, and then the scale of that will be unmaintainable. Um, test writers uh, and readers also need to become fluent with the framework, uh, and again, we'll talk about what that means a little bit later uh, in the talk. You need to choose a tool where that's possible. Um, another uh, anti-pattern that I see often is people choose a tool that works for what they need to do, but is not well maintained. Uh, so I had one customer that chose uh, a Java driver. Uh, tool for web testing uh, that hadn't been had had a recent commit since 2008. I said, "Well, okay, are you guys going to maintain this when they're when you run into problems in Roadbox? Are you guys going to make the commits to make it better? Um, you, you have to choose something with an active community, something that's actively maintained and thought about and has a direction. And then, lastly, as I mentioned in the beginning, you need to find something that fits into your team and your workflow and how." Uh, your organization is structured uh, and how tests are executed. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later as well. So there are many drivers here. It's just a, a small smattering of drivers, uh, ones that I tend to think are good across different technologies. There are many. Um, and if you are embarking on an automation effort, you should, and these are all uh, open source, but you should test your drivers. If, if you're doing web testing, what you say is, well, okay, we're doing web testing. Which driver fits what we're trying to do the best? Often you see people say, well, I've used this thing in the past, and so therefore since I'm fluent with it, let's use it again. And that is definitely an anti-pattern anti because the technology that you're testing uh, could uh, differ pretty uh, substantially uh, by, by driver. So pick a driver that really fits uh, what you're trying to do. The next point is that the drivers that you choose need to be uh, driven pro uh, programmatically. Um, uh, writing tests in XML, HTML, Excel spreadsheets where there's no underlying code structure for you to write against and maintain is not maintainable in the long term. Uh, and we know, you know, Selenium started out with HTML files. Um, and then RC uh, really made Selenium popular. Uh, you cannot maintain uh, a bunch of Excel spreadsheets uh, as your main uh, level uh, of, of driving your drivers. You need uh, uh, programmatic control. So next, there are frameworks that are um, uh, on top of the drivers that help you uh, express your test and maintain uh, your tests in the long term, and I'm going to talk about a few. So JBehave is the granddaddy of behavior-driven development tools. It's Java-based, and it allows you to basically write uh, scenarios that are based on the Kirkin syntax uh, and link those to uh, Java scenario classes. Cucumber is uh, similar to JBehave, but it started out uh, as a Ruby um, um, uh, framework for uh, acceptance testing and behavior-driven development. Uh, it now supports multiple technologies, and it's a similar style to JBehave in that you have uh, these specifications there in uh syntax, which I personally don't like, but that's neither here nor there. Um, and uh, you can uh, link code uh, to define a particular step. We have Twist. Uh, which is what ThoughtWorks Studios has addressed, uh, has built to address this problem. Twist is not only a framework, uh, which allows you to link code and conceptual steps, but it's also uh, an IDE, which allows you to do a lot more complex things in terms of managing 
uh, functional tests, and I'll go into some of the kind of concepts later. And then the granddaddy of uh, um, specification-based testing tools in general is FIT and its uh, successor, Fitness. And uh, for those of you who don't know, FIT was created by Ward Cunningham, who is uh, also, also the creator of the wiki. Uh, he created FIT actually on a ThoughtWorks project, uh, and Fitness is the wiki implementation of FIT. So structuring tests. You've chosen a driver, you've got a framework, how should you uh, think about structuring your test uh, in the long term? So the first thing, and I mentioned this before, is the idea of declarative test versus imperative test. And the main distinction between something being declarative and something being imperative is that when I do something declarative, I have no concern for how it's done. Uh, and so the example I give here on the slide is transfer loan an amount of $400 to my account. I don't care how that's done. I'm, I'm just doing a transfer. And at a manual test level, again, that's a very readable thing, right? If I have that as a line on an a old school test plan, I can see that and I can go, okay, yeah, I know what that's doing. Uh, even as a layperson who may not understand the domain, someone who understands English can uh, grok what that's about. Um, but something imperative is type uh, uh, $400 in the loan amount box, select my account from the drop down list, and click the transfer button. That kind of level of a test is difficult, particularly over a, a long scenario, to extract what the point is because you're constantly doing uh, a small mechanical thing. I'm interacting with a checkbox. I'm interacting with a drop-down list. Uh, those things are the how. And test specifications um, in your framework should be declarative. So what the test is about should talk about the domain concepts, your intent behind the test, and your mechanics, how that's done, uh, what buttons I'm clicking on, what I'm doing. Those should be imperative. An example uh, here is a fake application uh, where I've got, uh, I'm logging in to the app as an administrator, I'm uh, clicking this override setting and so that I can create workflows, and then I'm creating workflows and I'm verifying that that is all happening. And you can see the same concept in an imperative style test where, again, this is much more difficult to understand what the point is. I'm logging into the page. I'm typing this in a box. I'm clicking a drop down. That's an imperative uh, style test, and that's what you don't want to do um, um, in, in your specifications. So in other words, this is how you want to structure things. And again, this talk isn't very technical in terms of code, but there are a couple times I have some pseudocode. And here you have function or method called login and it has a bunch of steps in it on the left hand side and then you have set workflow settings which again we turn them to true in this example uh, and there's some steps in there and now my test is login and set the, the workflow settings equal to true. Again that even with pseudocode that's understandable. Um, the bad example and what you see a lot of test scripts written as is at this very flat imperative level where they say open, uh, type this, do this, do this, do this. Uh, the former is maintainable, the latter is not. <laughs> so to summarize in, in a different way, you want to separate the specification of a test or its intent from the execution mechanics. And when choosing a framework, your framework should help you create and maintain the separation. You want it to be clear that this is the test that's specified, this is the mechanics for how it actually works. Uh, and once you have uh, uh, a specification and you have steps and concepts in your specification, those steps are going to be your unit of maintenance. And that's a very important concept, that the, where I have intention, where I have a step concept, something that's at a business domain uh, layer, that's my unit of maintenance. And that's what, what I'm going to be thinking about maintaining as opposed to thinking about maintaining raw code. So uh, if I have those steps, then uh, another great technique for making those steps 
uh, maintainable is to be dry. Uh, and dry, the acronym is from the pragmatic programmers, uh, and they define it as every piece of knowledge must have a single, unambiguous, authoritative representation within the system. Uh, and so uh, when you think about this in terms of tests, that means a concept like login, a concept like transfer, uh, this amount from one uh, account to another should have a single place in your test suite where that exists. Uh, and that that single place is what is reused throughout your test suite. Again, we often see that people will uh, write very flat tests where they're doing the same things over and over again. And when it comes time to repair an error, um, the fact that it doesn't exist in one place is very problematic. You want to then, given that you do have this one concept of, of login, make sure that as you're authoring tests that you're reusing it uh, and that you have a mechanism, as I stated earlier, for reusing uh, um, the, the concepts that you come up with in your test suite. So what this leads to is when I break um, transferring um, uh, money from one account to another, that may affect several tests that may uh, look like a cascade of failures, but I've actually broken one idea. And when I go fix that one idea, I've now fixed all the tests. Uh, and so I'm not trying to go to 15 different tests and monkey with them to make sure that they're maintainable. The other thing is that, obviously, within the realm of human comprehension, you cannot, <coughs> you can't understand your entire uh, set of concepts and tests uh, set of concepts and steps within your test suite. Uh, and so they need to be discoverable. Uh, so if I wrote something two weeks ago or I wrote something two months ago, how do I uh, know what's there when I go to write an author a new test? How do I uh, make sure that I don't do a delete account and that my uh, coworker next to me doesn't do a delete account and then if I'm in a distributed team, the guy across the water doesn't do a, a delete account as well. We need to be able to find them uh, in the longer term. One of the problems that we often see, uh, and particularly this goes back to that, uh, the, the concept of being an imperative thing in an object-oriented world, is that people don't know how to do abstraction uh, in an automated test suite. And one of the great rules of thumb is that the abstraction in your test suite should line up very closely with the conceptual hierarchy in your business domain. So that, again, I'm doing abstraction at my concepts, at my level of intent, and not at the code level. So an example here is I might care about checkout, and I might do an action that's called checkout. Uh, and then in another test, I might have a higher level concept called purchase, which includes checkout. Uh, and so I'm aggregating at conceptual levels, and I'm, I'm building bigger things off of smaller things at conceptual levels and not at code levels. And so here's a, a diagram to that. In other words, you, you really want to start from small levels of business value and link, keep your code close to your intent, and then take those small intents and build bigger things uh, based off of those. That's easy to maintain because intent doesn't change much, right? If you're building a social network and you have the concept of friending someone, that's not going to go away. How you may friend someone, the, on the edges, you may add new concepts to following and friending people, but the basics are not going to magically reorient themselves. However, if you do the opposite, if you build these very flat tests, and you try to treat the code like you would an application and abstract lots of layers of code to maintain it, and it, the code actually gets far away from the intent, then that is hard to maintain uh, because you end up with situations where um, two, uh, one piece of code affects multiple intents in different ways. We had a project um, at ThoughtWorks where uh, they, they had done specification-based testing and had these specifications, and they did a major GUI refactoring of the application, basically rewrote the entire GUI of the application. And you would think, oh, they have the specs, they can reuse them. Um, they could not reuse them because the implementation of the code that was tied to the specs was such a ball of spaghetti underneath 
it abstracted at like five levels and these weird little helpers in these classes talk to these things that when it came time to, to, to change it, unwinding it was nearly impossible. And so, again, the headline here is uh, deal with intent and build abstraction based on intent and not on code. Uh, if you're doing that, that implies another structure. Uh, and that means that your classes and your fixtures, this is common, a test term are going to be big, and they should be big. They should be stacked. Uh, if uh, people are familiar with model view controller, uh, people often talk about having a, a, a substantial um, um, model and making sure the view is thin. And in testing, you kind of want to invert that. You want to have a very thick, fat uh, code association with your intent, uh, and that may mean very big classes, but lots and lots of tiny little methods. If you look at this uh, little pseudocode example here, uh, if I have a profile page that does a bunch of things and I've got um, different uh, methods on that profile page that do things in the test, um, I'm going to have lots of little things that I can do, right? Uh, if I update my name, that shouldn't be a long set of activities, right? It's clicking in a, a, a text field typing a new name and saving it, um, that should be a very small method. And having lots of little tiny methods and big classes uh, is very helpful as an organization mechanism because I know now when I have a problem on that page, I have a problem in that domain concept, I know where to go, and I know all of those little uh, methods and all those little steps share common code and share uh, constants, uh, share locators, etc. So you really want to make sure that you're modeling it this way. Helpers. So helpers is where I see uh, a lot of uh, teams actually go wrong. Uh, they know that they want to reuse code. So what they end up doing is creating lots of small bits of code that do things, and they try to reuse them. So I have a piece of code that sets this thing up. I have a piece of code that commits this transaction. I have a piece of code that uh, does this verification. Um, and um, helpers are great, and, uh, and by no means do I mean to imply not to have helpers. But the distinction is that helpers should always uh, not have a semantic meaning in terms of your test. So the example I give here is if I'm setting up a database, uh, that doesn't have any semantic meaning to the, at the business level what I'm trying to test. That's okay to be in a helper. But if I'm doing something like opening a new account, even though it's something I need to do often, that needs to be maintained at the, at the code test, test code level, and it should always be linked to a piece of intent. So make sure that if you have lots of little functions that help you do things, that those things are ancillary to the semantic core of the things that you're trying to test. Uh, and not you don't want a proliferation of hundreds of helpers that do these small things that interact with your test, particularly because, again, in terms of fluency uh, with your test suite, they're difficult to find and to reuse. Um, the biggest error that I tend to see with automated test uh, suites, or not the biggest, it's the most common error, is that people use cross-test uh, dependencies. And this goes to, again, uh, some of the things that Martin Fowler talks about in his non-determinism essay. Uh, but using one test to set up another, because the setup is expensive, is a problematic uh, way to understand if your test is actually validating things. Because you can uh, create cascades, you can yeah, get to a state where you think, well, this previous uh, test passed, and I'd set up my state well for the next test, but actually it did something else to the environment in a way that I didn't quite clearly understand, and that creates a failure as well. Um, so you, you want um, each individual test um, to, um, 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 to, to, to set up itself and not have um, uh, these cascades that result from cross-test dependency. And you, to do this, you really need to invest in quick setups and teardowns. Uh, and uh, 
uh, we see this a lot that people say, well, okay, set up, setting, uh, setting up and tearing down stuff is complicated, and it doesn't have to be. One, your framework should help you manage it, um, but um, you, you need to be mindful of all the things that constitute a setup, whether that be the environment configuration, network configuration, database, and the data. You need to think, okay, what does this test need to be in place to run, and then focus on how to get it there quickly. So you don't necessarily need to, from soup to nuts, restart an application and reconfigure everything on every test. But on every test that I run, the state should be the same as the, the test before it that ran. So if I, I, if I monkey around uh, on one test, that test needs to restore the system to the state it was before I monkey around. And if you keep that as a uh, running thing, that every test does that, okay, I created some project data um, to make this test. I verified it all worked. Now I'm going to get rid of that project data so that I can start from that clean state again. Then you'll uh, be able to maintain things much easier. The other uh, little minor tip is that sometimes you want to a hydrated environment uh, um, in, a, in a faster way as opposed to I need to set up all this data and I'm going to actually click through the GUI to do the setup. No, I want the database to be in the right state. I want this, uh, the session to be in the right state, etc. cetera. Um, database updates are a lot faster than creates. And so you can actually, uh, we've seen on some projects, get very quick uh, database setup time by using updates. Uh, the last point here is that if you want to move in terms of continuous delivery to reducing that feedback cycle time, getting your tests to run very quickly, you're going to eventually need to parallelize them. And if you have uh, uh, tests that are dependent, if you don't have clean setups and teardowns, you're not going to be able to, uh, to, to run those tests in parallel. We um, open source a thing called Test Load Balancer that uh, works well with Go and I believe a few other continuous integration uh, uh, type servers uh, that allows you to say, here are my test suite. It looks at the execution time and it says, okay, how can I parse this work out to a series of uh, build agents to get the test time down low? If you don't have good setups and teardowns, you can't take advantage of that kind of tool. Uh, so I mentioned uh, the page object pattern a little bit earlier, uh, but this is a common a way of organizing fixtures or your, your test classes. And that is basically any um, uh, part of your application that could be described as a page, and this obviously differs from web apps to thick clients, et cetera, that I would encapsulate all of the functionality that deals with that uh, representation in one place. Now, um, that has several benefits. Uh, one, to make sure that I don't have leaky um, uh, parts of my uh, test execution that happen in places that they shouldn't. So I know that on on the profile page that these are the actions that happen on the profile page. Um, for, uh, the page object pattern classically uses uh, method chaining where uh, every uh, page object, when it does something, returns another page object so that you can make sure you're uh, internally consistent in where you're navigating in your test. I don't think that's necessarily that important, but it's a nice, nice to have. Um, the, the positives of the pattern are clear uh, in terms of the, the organization of the test suite and the readability of the test suite, and it gives you a nice uh, way to interact with your fixtures. Um, it does break down in a couple places. If you have, um, and we see this often, unfortunately, people breaking the web, but having a, a website that functions more like a thick client and that you don't navigate away from the core page, you're kind of in one page and it does a bunch of JavaScript calls and you never do a page uh, reload, that uh, sometimes your, um, your, your page object can get really big. Similarly, if you have site that uses a lot of the same page elements across each page, then it might not be the best organization mechanism if I already always have this right-hand sidebar that does these things. I always have this left-hand sidebar that does these things. Maybe you want your 
actual page objects to be the things that you include often in your pages and not the, the logical page themselves. So again, you see here, this on profile page has a bunch of small methods on it that do things uh, in uh, on this page in terms of my test. Uh, this is probably the most controversial thing I'll say uh, in uh, this webinar, but I think it's a really important uh, point. Uh, in automated testing talks uh, in the last several years, this has become really popular, the, the auto test automation pyramid, and it's not necessarily uh, correct anymore. And Mike Cohen came up with this, I believe, in 2007 or so. Um, and the, the, the reason people start talking about this test pyramid is that often you see inverted pyramids, that people do a bunch of acceptance testing or functional testing and not very much unit testing. And unit testing is very important. It's very important for lots of reasons that I won't uh, kind of take the, the whole webinar to go into. But needless to say, unit testing helps maintain developer intention. It raises quality. And so unit testing is important. Uh, and, and the inverted pyramid is bad. However, uh, I think modern applications, uh, particularly those that have a lot of behavior in the client, uh, a lot of behavior in the GUI, um, they need uh, testing to be done from the GUI. And a lot of times people say to me, well, why don't you just do uh, unit testing at the GUI? If you've got a lot of JavaScript behavior, unit test the JavaScript. Yes, you should do that. But would you do... Uh, a large system where you didn't do integration testing across your components if you said, say, had a critical system like a credit card app. You'd want to do a fair amount of integration testing to that credit card service um, because it's an important part of your app and it's external. And when you add on things like GUI with lots of uh, complex behavior across browsers, uh, across lots of complex uh, different setups, that not testing that uh, because it's hard is the wrong strategy. And it, what I tend to talk about is if you do the right thing, testing GUIs uh, can be a lot easier, so then you don't have to say, well, I'm going to try to invert my effort to get away from testing it. Uh, not doing it because it's hard isn't the right solution. Figuring out how to make it easy, uh, if it's the right thing to do, is the right solution. So th the next thing that is really important in terms of uh, structure is refactoring. Uh, and I'm not going to go into refactoring, uh, refactoring deeply here um, in the interest of time, but it is a concept of um, <coughs> excuse me, a technique for restructuring your code um, without changing its external behavior uh, and not being able to change your code without it breaking how it currently uh, functions in your application. There are a lot of um, uh, different types of refactoring. If you go to refactoring.com, you can kind of look at the theoretical underpinning and the different uh, refactorings that exist. But the transformation, the little things that you want to do in code uh, are important uh, across a large test suite. Uh, and in a large test suite, you'll have uh, things like concepts that uh, at the, at the semantic level and at the code level that you want to change across the test suite. And given that you hopefully have uh, reused your uh, code, like we talked about earlier, and that you've done the right level of abstraction, then you, you'll want to be able to make wholesale changes across your test suite. So for example, you may want to rename uh, a, a, a certain concept, certain uh, level of intent, because you've added functionality to it and how you described it earlier doesn't quite represent what it means now. You may want to do things like I'm an Agile team and I log in, uh, um, I create login to an application as the first story and because we don't really care about it right now and we want to get to some other business value, we just make it put a username in and press submit. Well, when you come back to login to do it correctly, if you have test automation around what you've already done, you want to be able to make a change in one place and have that change propagate. Uh, and uh, things like, I want to introduce a parameter into that, because now I'm saying password instead of just username. How do I do that well without breaking my whole test suite? And to the extent that your framework um, 
support for factoring, it's a big win. And we really thought a lot about uh, the appropriate test for factoring when we built Twist. Uh, one of the things that people often struggle with is locator or um, in the old world, uh, an object repository. How do you deal with uh, things that you're, you're manipulating in your GUI, whether they be IDs, locators, etc.? Um, the first thing is to keep it dry. Uh, that if you're dealing with uh, a button that does something, that that button should exist in one place. And I think a lot of the object repositories and, and uh, older commercial tools try to deal with this by, you know, creating this large system that you have to do discovery on and object recognition. Uh, it doesn't need to be that hard. Um, what you need to do is use things like constants. Uh, in your uh, classes, like this is going to be the username field and this is how we'll refer to it um, via this locator. Or you may use property files, YAML files, something external to your code to list all the um, uh, locators by, uh, uh, by the thing that you're locating and group them in logical ways where you can refer to them later. So I know, hey, these things are changing. I have one clean place to go to, to make changes. And then, this is the hardest thing, um, but you want to agree on a format uh, for IDs uh, for dealing with this uh, across your uh, team. Uh, when you start a development project or if you're in the midst of a development project, come up with that with your development team. We need to be able to access these objects. We don't want to use XFAST and crazy expressions. Please help us do that and let's agree on logical names. The other thing that you can do is depending on your driver, you can also get away from using complex XPath or complex means of identifying some com object uh, by, um, by making sure the tool supports an easy way to reference an item. Uh, so uh, what, what you're really trying to do with your locators and IDs is make it simple for you to change them and also try to agree on a predefined way naming them and interact with, interacting with them so that you don't create overhead for yourself. Day-to-day -day things to do, and this is less about structure and code, but ways to think uh, as you kind of go through this maintenance process. <coughs> First, you want to do scenario planning and pruning. Um, one of the most common mistakes that people do when they get really going with an automated test suite uh, particularly an acceptance test uh, suite, is that they start doing story level acceptance tests. So I'm going to crank out a story. Oh, I did a story. And now what's the, the test that goes with that story? Quickly, that balloons to lots and lots of tests. And those tests aren't always relevant because stories are temporal and they're additive. So I have a story that does this thing now. I'm going to write a new story on top of that that changes that functionality. And now if I've done a bunch of, if I just blindly create a story level acceptance test for every test, I've got some duplication there. What you really need to think about is what's the, the user um, journey? What is the user going through? Again, at the business domain level, what are we trying to accomplish? And that scenario be a, a test. And then when I have a new story come up, I say, well, is this new? Can I bolt this on an existing test that exists? Uh, should, should I... Uh, modify this thing that exists? Should I throw away this thing um, that uh, already exists? And you want to uh, constantly be um, uh, thinking, evaluating, does this test need to exist? Does this test add to what we're trying to test? And, and can I continue to augment what I already have to get the right level of coverage as opposed to blindly creating new tests? And you want to prune things uh, where it makes sense. I've seen tests that uh, test suites that were thousands of tests um, where you were, the, the actual coverage and what they were doing wasn't that high and that when you refactored the test suite down to something more reasonable, you had less te test suites, uh, less tests rather in the suite and better uh, coverage of your overall application. The other thing is that sometimes uh, when tests fail, people fix them automatically instead of saying, well, um, is this test actually a valid test anymore, or do we just keep it around because it's there? The 
caveat to that is sometimes people delete tests they don't like, and you shouldn't do that. But you should really look at, is there a value of this test? Are we already, already testing it somewhere else? And does this, uh, does this test make sense? Um, lastly, um, many people start out with automation by automating the happy task, and that's fine. Uh, in my other talk on how to move from manual to automated testing, we talk about how to branch out from, from happy path. Uh, you want to look for opportunities as you're looking at your scenarios constantly to say, all right, we've done just a happy path here, but we need more negative paths uh, in, in our tests, and, and here's how we're going to add them, and here's how we're going to do it. Uh, you want to avoid throwaway uh, automation. Auto throwaway automation happens, and it's fine. Uh, but you want to orient yourself to say, hey, how can I maximize my activity here so that my automation is not sucking up all my time? Uh, and again, if you follow a bunch of the techniques that we talked about uh, earlier, so you make things reusable and modular and you write uh, journeys instead of individual story level excessive tests and you're refactoring, if you're doing all these things, then um, uh, you can avoid throwaway automation. What's really important here is that you want to treat your um, your uh, your test automation as important as your actual production code. And if you treat it with the same level of love, uh, then uh, you can avoid a lot of wasted effort. Uh, build fluency with the, the, the test suite. So um, you want a test author uh, and even a test reader to be able to sit down and say, I need to write a new test. What can I use that's there to make, one, this test maintainable, but two, this test easy to write? If I know my test has 15 steps and I've already implemented 10 of them, and then I just got to do five new things, then that's a really great win. I see people, and there's a couple frameworks that I didn't mention that are actually bad for this. I see people do acceptance tests that are essentially new every time. And they build no uh, situational fluency with the, the framework at all. Similarly, I see this a lot with keyword-driven uh, frameworks. It's not that keyword frameworks are bad. It's just that typically they're implemented at the wrong level. And you see this keyword framework with, like, hundreds of keywords uh, that are quite difficult to uh, that are quite difficult to uh, use correctly. And then no one has any fluency with them. And the actual act of writing a new test is really very, very slow. Um, and so uh, what you should get to is that um, with each additional new test, the test, the time to write a new test should go down dramatically. Um, so um, if you're doing it right, you should see that, that improvement. And we have one of our Twist customers that's seen about a 40% improvement in the time it takes them to write a new automated test because they're getting the right reuse, they have the right fluency, and they have discoverability in terms of the large set of concepts and steps that they're building up. Um, I don't have time to talk about it thoroughly. It's an excellent piece, but you should read Martin Fowler's post on non-determinism. Go Google it. Um, it talks about how to isolate tests. It talks about the common reasons for flakiness like asynchronization, which is a huge thing. If you have an app that requires sort of asynchronous um, um, uh, activity, that's a real ripe ground for uh, for, for problems and, and flaky tests. So please go read that. We'll cover that in, in the webinar. And then lastly, uh, you want to upskill. So again, uh, there's this, this tension between uh, test automation, particularly for acceptance tests, being very imperative, uh, and the way that we write code down being object oriented, and that th there's a lot of benefits to object orientation. So you want to use object orientation, but realize that test um, automation isn't rocket science. It doesn't have to be hard. It's when we don't apply the right techniques, the right ways of organizing tests, that it becomes quickly unmaintainable, um, and that. Uh, it's actually, uh, you don't need to have the most technical team in the world to apply these techniques and get a long-lived maintainable test suite. Um, and learn a uh, dynamic language or use one if it's, 
fits appropriately into your uh, team and your uh, org uh, setup to test because um, they're, they're very productive, particularly in terms of, you know, the, the um, old derogatory term of calling them scripting languages. You are writing things that look like scripts with imperative mechanics and tests. And it's great to have a dynamic language to be able to get some productivity there. There are things like um, how uh, Groovy and Ruby and Python have libraries to deal with certain things that are quite onerous in uh, some other languages that, that, that are really simple. And then my, my final point, uh, we talked a lot about automation. You really don't want to get lost in the automation. Sometimes as technology people and uh, you know, I'm definitely guilty of, of this myself. We geek out on the technology, and often we see people geek out on automation. And really, what automation is about, it, it's about, it's about the testing and having that fast feedback and knowing that the application you're releasing into production is in the right state. So don't lose track of the testing part in doing the automation because it's not an end unto it, uh, an end unto itself. So um, that's. My talk. I'm a little over in terms of time for questions, but I uh, have time for questions now. Okay, thanks.